Greetings, everybody, and happy August. I hope you were uh, managing to get away a little bit from the heat, maybe indoors right now watching us and enjoying some air conditioning. Uh, it's great to see everybody for the 38th of our town hall series. As always, I want to thank our Society for Leading Medicine for uh, graciously sponsoring this and supporting this, and especially want to thank our chairs, Doctors w Dr. Waverly and Adam Peaks and Kristen and John Berger uh, for their great leadership of our society. You know, this can be a very interesting topic. It's actually the most response we've seen in a while for one of these topics. Uh, they wrote me a bad pun, which is we hit a nerve um, because we're talking about uh, two very common things that uh, cause uh, pain and that affect many of us. So we're gonna be talking about headaches and specifically migraine headaches. And we're gonna be talking about uh, back pain and how we manage that. Dr. Julia Jones is here, uh, one of our expert neurologists who'll be talking about migraines and headaches. And Dr. Kamran Safi is here, one of our orthopedists who's an expert in managing back pain. And we very much look forward to hearing from both of them. And I know you do as well, because we've got tons of questions uh, coming in and many of you uh, signed up today and we're delighted for that. Uh, as always, if you have questions, you can text them to 37607. You text the word DeBakey and then you'll be able to uh, send those in or you can do that within the chat box as well on the live stream. We also have Dr. Angela Salemi, who's one of our neurology residents. I believe she's in her third year of neurology residency, who is in the background there typing furiously. So you can get very specific answers as well there uh, with her if you'd like. So uh, thank you to her for being here as well. So I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Jones. Okay, good morning. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Just gonna have a brief review for y'all on migraine headaches. Um, as you know, they're pretty darn prevalent and occur in about 18% of all women, about eight to 9% of all men. They often start in the teenage years, uh, but they are more prevalent in your 30s and 40s. Uh, it's interesting in that about uh, over half of the visits when people go see their primary care doctors is usually, it can be for a headache. It's the third most common reason people go to the emergency room. Uh, unfortunately, uh, migraines are highly disabling, they're costly. Uh, they're underdiagnosed and also undertreated. Migraine patients basically are hardwired to tip into that pain. Uh, we know that migraines are genetic, and you go, well, what is a migraine? How do you define it? Well, we have certain criteria, and, and most all headaches are defined by the duration and some of the clinical features. Um, but in migraine patients, uh, mom or dad probably gave it to you, um, and then we know migraine brains are just easily tipped into that headache, and that can be just a, a mundane change in your routine meaning you slept in on a Saturday, you were late for breakfast, that can actually uh, be a headache trigger. Earlier therapies, well, going back in time, uh, they weren't so great. Um, we know that as long as there've been humans on earth, there've probably been migraine headaches. Uh, we have evidence of a, a skull uh, that has been trepanated from 9,000 BC. Trepanated skull means they cut a hole in the skull to let out your bad humors or your evil spirits. Um, Going forward, craniotomies, Dr. Harvey Cushion doing craniotomies in the early 1900s, he would operate where the pain was. Uh, these were not all that successful. Then, of course, bloodletting, cupping, cupping still being done today for headaches. Uh, hydroelectric baths in the 1800s, they used hot oil in the ear, plasters, uh, hot irons to the head. And the 50s, psychotherapy. If you went to the ER, you were admitted, you automatically got a psych consult. But most people were fairly normal. And then the medications used to treat migraines have had great advancements, mainly because of our understanding of molecular biology, neurotransmitters, and neuropeptides. So now we have specific drugs for migraine patients. Uh, back when I started practice in uh, 1992, we had the ergots, ergostat, uh, cafergot, very nauseating, a lot of side effects. Um, and then, but that's been around since 1920. Depakote was used for epilepsy, Topamax for epilepsy, then they were FDA approved for migraine patients. So most all of our older drugs were borrowed uh, and used for migraine headaches. I mean, Depakote was for epilepsy, beta blockers, propanolol, the stage fright drug was used for blood pressure, uh, old tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, they were used for mood disorders, and then it was used for migraine headaches. The triptans came out in the 90s, so that's the decade of the 90s. Imitrex, sumatriptan came out as a shot in 1992, but it was discovered by a Glaxo scientist way back in 1984. So the triptans were a big advancement in the 90s for acute treatment of headaches. Going back historically, mentioned these have been around as long as we have. 
in Mesopotamia, the text that back 4,000 years ago, uh, but they thought the headaches were spiritual rather than a physical ailment. Uh, the Egyptians had a nice record uh, in something called the Ebers Papyrus. It was a document that outlined several different medical disorders, including migraine headaches, and that dates back to 1550 BC, uh, which is on display in a museum. Hippocrates had a little bit more common sense. He thought it was really attributed to a physical and or a pathological state, not from some spiritual bad, badness. Uh, and then mentioned surgical treatment, trepanation, uh, was done uh, many, many years ago BC. Also during the Renaissance with warfare and head trauma, trepanation was more practiced. And that's probably because they had head trauma rather than a migraine and complications with a, a subdural hematoma. Uh, but 1800s, they did define headaches a little bit better. 20th century, it was established but still unclear on treatment. I mentioned uh, there's a neurosurgeon, Dr. Harvey Cushing, in the early 1900s would operate where the pain was. He didn't often um, publish his results because they weren't really very successful. In the 1950s, uh, they were called classic and or common migraines. Uh, common migraines means no aura, classical with aura. Uh, Bickerstaff had described a basilar artery migraine. And these are migraine patients that may have trouble speaking, they can be disoriented, they may have numbness and tingling. So this actually is a migraine that often gets to our ER and these people might get TPA, but migraines can do that. Uh, and aura was thought to be constriction of blood vessels, giving us deficit like tingling or uh, change in vision, followed by vasodilation. But we know that theory doesn't really explain why we have the migraine pain. And it was discovered there were other substances, neuropeptides, uh, that were probably causing some sterile uh, vascular inflammation. We look at why do we have a headache? Well, again, genetic, mom or dad, uh, you get them, why? Change in routine or homeostasis. So the hypothalamus, which tells us when we're hungry or tired, seems to be the originator of the headache. Um, so keeping a good homeostasis, a good balance, really goes a long way in preventing migraines. But up to a third of patients, no matter how perfect they are, need some sort of prevention because they're having too many headache days. Uh, we know that you know, if you're not eating, not sleeping, hormonal change, stressors, these are all reasons migraine patients might go into that headache. Um, and then they've done studies with food. 26% of migraine patients will find a food trigger, such as red wine, chocolate, uh, nuts, aged cheeses, but only 26%. Um, they've done studies, okay, here's your chocolate bar. Hey, you had no headache, but last time it was horrible. The last time you were stressed out, you hadn't slept, et cetera. Um, so we don't always get a headache from those food triggers. Now, the migraine diagnosis is basically defined uh, on the screen here. You have to have at least five attacks. Uh, usually it's gonna last four to 72 hours. There are other headaches that last 15 minutes to three hours. Well, that's not a migraine. It's usually a slowly building pulsing pain on one side of the brain, head. It can be bilateral 40% of the time. It's worse if you move around, cough or sneeze. Uh, and you have to have some degree of lights or, or, or noise sensitivity or some people have nausea. Uh, I know for me, I turned down the radio and I've got a pounding headache and I'm gonna take my medicine quickly. So the international classification for headache disorders, we're on the third one. Uh, this actually wasn't done until 1988, but it greatly helped researchers uh, discover those newer medicines that have been more effective. Uh, also a turning point was the development of the American Headache Society back in 1959, and they published their first journal back in 1961. So migraine aura, you heard me mention this earlier, a third of migraine patients will have an aura, and it's typically visual, but it can be tingling or paresthesias. Um, the migraine aura has two interesting phenomena. There's something negative you can't see through, and there's something positive, moving or jiggly or bright. It's often described as a C-shaped kaleidoscope that starts in one point in your visual field and then goes across. Generally 15 to 20 minutes it resolves and then watch out, usually that throbbing headache is going to occur. Now there are a group, and I'll call it the over 50 crowd, who will get the aura and they don't get a headache. Uh, but it's still gonna be rather disabling. Uh, but the interesting thing with migraine aura is there's little else that reproduces that. It's got a positive and a negative phenomenon. If you have a stroke that affects the eye, a clot flips up the ophthalmic artery, there's a blackout, there's a shade coming down, it's all negative. If we have a retinal detachment, we might have flashes of lights, in the periphery, it's positive phenomenon. But that combo, that combo platter together is a migraine aura. 
So the new buzzwords these days are calcitonin gene related peptide. So this is a 37 amino acid peptide in the central nervous system. It's in the peripheral nervous system. It's in your skin, it's in your gut. It does other things, but we know that CGRP plays a big role in initiation of the head pain. We found it an increased uh, amount in venous blood during a migraine. If you give CGRP intravenously, it causes a horrible headache. And now we have very effective medicines that block CGRP or its receptors and are very effective in getting rid of the migraine and preventing them. Also, these new medicines have a lot less side effects and are actually safe in heart patients who's had a stent to bypass uh, blood pressure folks and even uh, folks with strokes. So these are very safe drugs. Um, and some of our older ones, like Imatrex I mentioned that was discovered in 84, uh, Sumatriptan in that class cannot be used with coronary artery disease or difficult to control blood pressure and theoretically not to be used with a thrombotic stroke. So of the new medicines we have, you, you see Lady Gaga, others advertise these on TV. Uh, there's Nurtec, Ubrelvi, Culipta, Zavepret. These are all the G-pants, and they're blocking the CGRP receptor, working in the periphery of the brain. Nurtec, Ubrelvi are for acute treatment. They work in about 40 minutes. Side effects, low side effects are placebo numbers. Nurtec, 2% of folks can have nausea. Ubrelvi, the same, but a little sedation at 2%. Uh, they work in 40 minutes. They don't have a lot of the fatigue and tightness uh, that the other triptans ha had uh, that we still use today. Culipta, a preventative. It's a daily pill for migraine prevention. Side effects, a little more than placebo. We've got a little constipation, nausea, and fatigue. Uh, Zave's Pret just recently came out. It's the nasal spray version of these, which is nice because it works in 15 minutes. Doesn't taste great, uh, but remember, Nurtec and Ubrelvi don't work for 40 minutes. So that can be a problem for those folks who wake up, bad headache, and they're nauseated. The monoclonal antibodies, you've, you've seen these as well. There's three injections and an infusion. These are all large molecule monoclonal antibodies against CGRP or against the CGRP receptor. Um, they work a little slowly. They don't do much for about a week, and they usually kick in within the first couple of months. So we usually recommend trying them as a preventative over a three month period of time to see if we're gonna have a responder. So in the Amovic study, 70% of their study patients at five years cut their headaches in half. 50% cut their headaches three quarters. Uh, the, the, it, it kicks in a little bit slowly just because it's a large molecule. Um, now, Viepta, you see, is an infusion. It works actually in 24 to 36 hours. You go to an infusion center, 30 minutes later, you're done. You repeat it every three months. Um, you know, some of these keep you have to have a little bit more of an approval with your insurance system to, to get them going. But the Amovig and Galati, uh, Ajovi, uh, for most commercial folks, it's about $5 a month. Um, and it's a little auto injection you do at home and these live in your refrigerator. So pretty easy to you, minimal side effects. They didn't study pregnancy and breastfeeding. So we don't recommend using these if you're, oh, I might, oops, be pregnant. Botox, you know about Botox, it's been around for, since the 70s. Uh, it was really discovered when it was used for cosmetics, which I think was approved in 2002, that those had injections in their frontalis between the eyes had decreased headaches. Well, it was approved in October of 2010 for migraine prevention. Uh, but you can only use it if you have chronic migraines, which is defined as more than uh, 15 days of headaches. You failed a couple of old school preventatives. Uh, now the Botox is given every 12 weeks, but it's in 31 spots five units, so it's kind of, I say, shotgunned everywhere, but we're blocking CGRP release. And you know Botox blocks, well, makes wrinkles go away because it blocks acetylcholine, but we're doing this with migraines because it blocks CGRP. It's blocking a different nerve than those monoclonal antibodies block. Side effects, I have 9% can have neck pain, and that can usually be tweaked and adjusted with your dosing. And then 4% could have a droopy lid. Try to avoid that by not going too far lateral with the injections. But you can see this is just a diagram of where we go. Three between the eyes, four in the frontalis, four on each temporalis. In the back, occipitalis has three on each side, some of the neck muscles, and then in the trapezius. So again, this has been around since 2010 for chronic migraines only as a preventative. And you might ask, well, who needs a preventative? Generally those who have more than six or eight headache days in a month. And then lastly, just to touch on the Norivio armband, you've heard of different devices, Gamacor, Cephaly. Uh, this actually has uh, data that's not inferior to medicines. It actually has about a 60% pain relief 
at two hours, which is the same as Nurtec in Ubrelvi. Uh, the Nerivio on band goes on. You control it with your smartphone. It feels a little warm. It's stimulating the biceps nerve, and it's sending inhibitory impulses to your brainstem to guess what? Decrease release of CGRP. Um, so now it's approved for prevention, used 45 minutes every other day, or it can be used for an acute migraine put on in the first 20 minutes of the headache. So this remote electronic neuromodulation is sort of a neat thing. It can be used in, in children over 12, and it's very safe with pregnancy. Um, so thankfully, we have new therapies. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, answering some questions later. Let me pass the baton now uh, to Dr. Safi. Before we move to Dr. Safi, uh, I want to quickly just uh, mention also that we have Dr. Adam Green. I was remiss in not uh, introducing him earlier. He's one of our spine surgery fellows, so he too is on the chat line. So if you have questions about back pain, he's there to answer them as well. Dr. Safi. Thank you for having me. Um, so we'll be discussing uh, low back pain. Uh, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon here at Houston Methodist, and we'll be discussing back pain from a, uh, a spine surgery perspective. So just to start with an overview of back pain, uh, there are numerous etiologies of low back pain which make it such a challenging uh, situation to treat and we'll discuss those in detail. Uh, we'll review the non-operative treatments of low back pain and then following that with the operative treatments uh, and these can be broken down into three basic components, decompression, fusion, and realignment. And we'll discuss some of the operative technologies that we have available to us for safety and reproducibility of uh, spine pathology in the operating room. And then we'll discuss some minimally invasive options for uh, treatment of uh, spinal conditions with surgery. So the mechanical causes of back pain or leg pain are numerous, unfortunately, but we've developed some systems to kind of tease it out when we see patients in the clinic. Lumbar strain tends to be the most common uh, cause of back pain, followed by degenerative disease, which are arthritic conditions of the discs, facet joints, or sacroiliac joints. Uh, fractures, which can be due to either commonly osteoporosis or to stress fractures, uh, and then spondylolisthesis, which is uh, an arthritic condition either of the facet joints or uh, stress fractures of the spine, which can lead to some instability of the spine. Next, we have spinal deformity, such as scoliosis or uh, kyphosis, which is forward posture of the spine. And then lastly, we have disc herniations and spinal stenosis, which can cause back and leg pain. There are rare but very important causes of back pain, including cancer, infection, inflammatory arthritis, as well as non-spine related issues such as renal disease, aortic aneurysms, and GI disease, which can cause back pain on rare occasion. So our treatment options are really boiled down to four basic options, medications, physical therapy, injections, and surgery, which is a last resort and is typically uh, not the treatment for the vast majority of patients. But back pain is uh, very much a multidisciplinary approach that's required for success. And so that requires orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, physical medicine rehab, pain management, physical therapy, and endocrinologists. And I think we're very fortunate here at Methodist uh, because we have such a deep bench and such uh, widespread uh, uh, specialties that we can uh, send our patients to, to the right place quickly and easily when we, have, when we see them in the office for back pain. So the non-surgical treatments, uh, medications, which I mentioned before, so these comprise of NSAIDs, which are uh, ibuprofen or naproxen, muscle relaxants, such as Flexerol or Roboxin, uh, and other medications, such as Lyrica and Gabapentin. And, and these can help, particularly for nonspecific back pain or uh, lumbar strain. Next, we have physical therapy. There are many different types of therapy, and we have some excellent physical therapists who can uh, help patients with either something called Dickensy therapy or Schra therapy and others, uh, and then injections. So uh, injections include many different types, uh, trigger point injections, which are for muscular type pain, SI joint injections, which are for arthritic conditions of the SI joint, uh, medial branch blocks, which are 
uh, um, blocks of the nerve that come off of the posterior rami of the spine at the level and they innervate the facet joints. So patients who have more pain extending their back, uh, they will be probably more amenable to a medial branch block, whereas a basal vertebral ablation, which is a newer technology that's been out, uh, will treat the nerve that goes off the ventral rami uh, to the uh, uh, vertebral body and to the disc. Um, so these are some of just the more recent developments for non-surgical treatments that have helped patients. Uh, in terms of surgical treatments, uh, we have three basic types of treatments that I mentioned before. We have decompression of the spine, fusion of an unstable segment, and re realignment of a spinal deformity. So this is an example of a patient with back and leg pain who underwent a decompression procedure by me. He had a disc herniation uh, that with pain in his back shooting down his right leg for greater than 12 weeks. And uh, he developed uh, uh, the pain despite uh, having non-operative treatment during that time. And so we use a minimally invasive approach, which is uh, we use a tubular uh, approach to remove and pluck out that disc herniation. Uh, it takes about an hour and the patient goes home the same day. Uh, so. so Fusion surgery is a type of surgery, as I mentioned before, where we stabilize an unstable segment. And this is a patient of mine who had what's called an L3 burst fracture. Uh, and so she had a severe back pain, of course, but also a neurologic deficit. And so for these patients, uh, it's important that we stabilize the spine. And, and for her in particular, we have to reconstruct the anterior column of the spine. Uh, and this is another patient of mine who had a spinal deformity, uh, and so she had severe back pain from her deformity due to being pitched over to the right side, but also being pitched forward, a condition we call kyphosis. And so we did a realignment surgery for her. Uh, and so her back pain improved significantly because she no longer needs to fire her extensor muscles to keep her upright. Um, and she's also centered uh, over what we call the cone of economy, which is a concept uh, from a uh, well-known French surgeon, uh, Jean Dubousset, where we try to keep the spine within a certain parameter of the pelvis. So uh, moving on, we try to do everything we can to do these surgeries in a uh, safe and reproducible manner. And I think another benefit of being at Methodist is we have access to an incredible amount of technology uh, to do this. Uh, some of the things we use or I utilize in the operating room here at Methodist are an intraoperative CT scanner, uh, intraoperative navigation, and spinal robotics. Um, and these can help make our uh, surgery safer and more reproducible. And this is an uh, animation of how we use intraoperative CT in the operating room. Once we place our uh, instruments uh, in the spine, we can then check everything with the CT scanner in the OR while the patient is asleep. And this ensures that everything is perfect before we leave the operating room. And this is just another uh, example of sort of how we make sure that everything is safe and reproducible. This is, uh, so building off of the CT scanner, now we have something called intraoperative navigation where we use the CT scanner in conjunction with navigation, we can actually see everything in real time on the CT screen. And this allows not only for safer surgery, but also allows us to make smaller incisions and allows for us to do more of our surgeries through a minimally invasive approach, which I'll discuss soon. Uh, and then lastly, we have uh, intraoperative robotics. And so there are certain cases and patients who benefit from this. Uh, this technology is uh, admittedly in its infancy, but uh, we are uh, seeing this becoming more and more uh, applicable uh, for patients. And then uh, lastly, we have uh, spinal arthritic conditions, uh, which can often be treated with minimally invasive approaches. And these approaches all have one thing in common, which is we use an inner body device to uh, open the spine uh, and recreate the disc that has previously collapsed. And this is an example of a patient of mine who had this procedure. And you can see uh, the ruler there shows it, the incision is basically an inch uh, to put in the hardware. Uh, and uh, that's an example uh, image on the right of the MRI. And what I'd like to kind of focus on is the uh, muscle here in the back for a patient who had open surgery has basically turned to fat uh, a couple years out. But the minimally invasive patient who had the same surgery but through a minimally invasive approach, the muscle is still uh, apparent and there's been several studies done showing this. So we can preserve muscle tissue uh, through these approaches. 
And this is uh, uh, one of the other types of minimally invasive surgeries. This is a uh, minimally invasive T lift where we put uh, screws again under CT guidance in the OR uh, through little poke holes. We use neuromonitoring, which is what the animation is showing there. And we open the spine uh, to provide uh, uh, space uh, as it has collapsed, the disc has collapsed there. Um, and once we open it, uh, which the animation will show, we put in a little spacer uh, to provide uh, space for the nerve root to exit there. Uh, and this allows uh, both the nerve root to decompress, but also allows us to stable an unstable segment of the spine. This is uh, an example of an minimally invasive T-lift. So the x-rays on the right are uh, both the preoperative and postoperative x-ray. And you can see the first x-ray on the right shows that uh, this patient has uh, right here at L4, L5, a slip, about a grade two slip here, uh, where they have uh, slipped forward due to instability of the spine, and that's causing severe back pain. And so this patient not only has instability, but has a deformity here. And so it's important that we recreate the normal alignment of the spine. So this patient has about 11 degrees of uh, what we call kyphosis. And now we've recreated 33 degrees of lumbar lordosis at the same level. So this patient's uh, overall angulation of the lumbar spine went from 24 degrees to 60 degrees, which is where it needs to be. Uh, and this is just a, uh, a video. So we've incorporated our research, obviously, uh, in terms of trying to lead medicine here. We've, uh, you know, this is actually this patient. And we've in incorporated neuromonitoring leads uh, on the patients pre-op and post-op where we can measure EMG as well as accelerometer data. And so we, not only do we ask the patients about their pain, but we try to functionally or objectively measure their function uh, preoperatively and postoperatively through our research. This is uh, the minimally invasive lateral approach where we start uh, and we go from the lateral aspect or from the flank uh, with the patient laying on their side in the operating room. And this is a patient of mine who had a collapse uh, of his spine on one side as well as a very large uh, ossified disc herniation here uh, that was compressing his uh, spinal column and his nerves and he had a neurologic deficit. So this allows us to recreate the alignment while also decompressing the spine uh, and it allows for faster recovery of the patients. Uh, and then lastly, we have a minimally invasive uh, A-lift, which is the last minimally invasive type of fusion surgery. Uh, and this we can approach from the front uh, and this is a patient here of mine who had a pretty severe uh, slip. So we can see instability where the L5 vertebral body is nearly falling off of the sacrum. And so we can come in through the front, open this up, put in our spacer here to recreate it, and then lock it in place uh, and pull the spine back. And this treats not only their back pain, but also the neurologic deficit. And then lastly, this is sort of more uh, recent technology is a lumbar disc replacement. And this is a patient of mine who had this about six months ago. He had failed, he had two prior surgeries with another surgeon for decompression of his spine and continued to have pain and was told he needed a fusion. But he's rather young and he didn't want a fusion. We talked about his options. And so he decided to have a lumbar disc replacement. And this can be an option in very specific patients. Uh, and the advantage here is that we can maintain the patient's motion. So where are we in terms of the future of back pain? Well, we have, uh, again, uh, a lot of resources. Uh, and I feel fortunate to be a Methodist to collaborate with some of the uh, leaders uh, in treatment of back pain. And so uh, we, our research team collaborates with a whole host of folks here at Methodist. Uh, and we have uh, actually a bone health initiative now uh, through our chair, Dr. Varner, uh, where uh, myself, uh, Dr. Woodridge, and Dr. Tabatabai, who's an endocrinologist here, uh, are the co-directors of that. And we are uh, working hard to treat osteoporotic uh, back pain. Uh, we work with uh, Atia Dalla from General Surgery for Sarcopenia and Frailty. We've got a great neuromonitoring team uh, headed by Dr. Allison. Uh, data analytics, uh, we have created databases, um, and Stephen Jones has been incredible for that. Uh, and we've just got a lot of projects looking at the treatment of back pain. So our goal moving 
forward in the future is to take our information and what we are learning from the clinic and OR, uh, develop, uh, these are some of the research we have ongoing, and then use that research uh, to build new treatments for the, uh, back pain. And uh, one in particular, we have a prospective randomized controlled trial that's starting uh, soon uh, for back pain. Uh, we also, uh, Methodist is now the leading site for the American Spine Registry um, in the U.S. So in conclusion, uh, it's a team approach for treating back pain uh, in, in order to have a personalized treatment for each patient. Uh, PMR, PT, pain management, and endocrine, surger endocrine and surgical subspecialties are critical uh, for collaboration and, and having patients having good outcomes. Uh, most patients will never need spine surgery and will do great with non-operative treatments, including medications, therapy, and injections. For those who require surgery, uh, there are minimally invasive options, and future treatments uh, we're hoping to be uh, effective through research. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. To, thank you to both physicians here and uh, uh, both fascinating talks on, on very commonly experienced uh, issues. I'm going to ask you both sort of a similar question. This is always me putting my primary care physician hat on. I want to keep people out of your hands and I want to keep people prevented from having back pain or prevented from having migraines. So let me start with back pain. And even starting for some of us with our kids as they're yeah. grown up, what, what are things we can do through life so we don't have back pain, so we don't develop many of these issues that you're describing? So that's a great question. And the research has shown that aerobic exercise is one of the best things we can do to prevent back pain. And in fact, there are studies showing that patients who've had chronic back pain defined as greater than 12 months uh, benefit the most from aerobic exercise more than any other treatment. So I think being in shape really helps. Um, a secondary uh, uh, exercise is doing core strengthening. So uh, there are certain types of physical therapy uh, called McKenzie therapy that can help uh, strengthen the extensor muscles in the back. And I think those are probably the two best things that we can do uh, to prevent uh, back pain. Okay, and so picking up on the core piece, if somebody out there wants to do some core exercises as as they're hopefully they're starting in their teens and twenties yes. and ongoing, what are a few of the best things they could do on their own? Not quite needing. A yeah, so yet. so I think there are two options. So on your own, I think just aerobic exercise, running, cycling, um, ellipticals, anything, you know, aqua therapy or swimming, those are all basically excellent and those have been shown to be really be the best. In terms of core strengthening, um, patients can either go and, you know, even have one session with a physical therapist and do them on their own, but there are a set of uh, extensor muscle exercises where patients will uh, strengthen their extensor muscles by extending their back while uh, uh, either having a very small amount of weight um, and helping that to strengthen those muscles. And that's a gradual thing that they can do over time. Um, but technique is very important, and so it's important that it's done properly. Great, and I, I assume embedded within that's weight because yeah. obesity certainly causes absolutely, absolutely, difficulty. yeah. So weight will exacerbate uh, pain for sure, and it depends. But non-specific back pain can be more related to weight, um, and so. A, the aerobic exercise really helps for multiple aspects. It helps keep your muscles uh, stronger. And we talked about sarco. I talked about sarcopenia briefly. But define that. What's sarcopenia? So sorry. For so 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 it's really frailty in some sense. So a lack or a decrease in muscle. And we all, as we uh, get you know to a certain age, we peak in terms of our muscle mass, and then it decreases over time. And so we see that that decrease in muscle mass correlates to a lot of things, including our surgical outcomes, but also to pain uh, and back pain as well. So strengthening, being in shape, those things can help reduce the decrease in muscle mass over time. Okay, my last question with that, I, I know we as an employer, right? Yeah. We, we think about this because back injuries are a common Absolutely. issue within many jobs, certainly jobs that do heavy lifting. So we even, I, mean, I take it every year, a back, yeah. uh, appropriate health of the back and yes. how, to, how to lift things. How important is that? And, and give us a, a quick synopsis for people of, hey, if you really don't want to have an acute injury, here's some basic tips on how to yeah. appropriately lift and appropriately use your back. So that's very important because we know from biomechanical studies that um, back pain uh, can be triggered often with uh, improper technique. And so when you want to lift something, particularly anything heavy, you want to bend at the knees and pick it straight up. If you lean forward to lift something, particularly something heavy over 15 pounds or so, uh, what will happen is all of the stress, the torque really, will be placed on the anterior, the front portion of the spine. And that can cause actually disc herniation 
conditions. And I see that, uh, unfortunately, in the office where people have lifted something, uh, leaned forward, lifts to something, and then they get a disc herniation. So I think that is a really important thing to keep in mind if you're lifting anything. Perfect. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask you related questions. So I guess first question is, is there anything somebody can prevent from ever getting a migraine to begin with, or is it just they got a short straw genetically and other things like that? And then once you answer that, really, if you do have any migraines, short of the medications, we'll talk about that more later, what are the kind of personal preventive strategies that are most effective in decreasing frequency of, of migraines? I think the short straw theory is correct. Okay. So uh, you're stuck with it, right? I so, believe yeah, it's okay. genetic, yeah. Um, now, as far as what can you do to prevent them, I, I mentioned making your hypothalamus happy. Your homeostasis <laughs> needs to be rather chill. So normalizing your meals, your sleep, your exercise, um, that goes a long way in, in helping prevent headaches, meaning you're, you're eating on time, you're not skipping meals, you're doing that cardio three times a week for 35 minutes, um, and then having a normal sleep pattern. So, you know, sometimes our shift workers, uh, it's a problem because they're doing a, a three, you know, 12 hour shifts in a row and they're off when they go home with their kids. And, and that could be a problem just like uh, other folks, bus drivers, police officers. So ideally meal, sleep, exercise, uh, but a third of folks are just gonna need a preventive no matter how perfect their, their hypothalamus is. Well, you know, I, I, I have migraines, hereditary. I don't get them very frequently, so haven't needed to see you, fortunately. But uh, uh, my mother, who, who gave them to me, has them very frequently, or had them, particularly in, in, in the past. My worst is Saturday morning. It's like I finally sleep in a little bit. I get some more sleep, and that triggers it. And or it's very or, annoying. So, or is it stress letdown? So, or stress letdown. I'm or not sure which. Or did you sleep so. through your usual breakfast yeah. time? Okay. So all may, of the above. Huh? It may so, be a combination so. of those factors. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll delve in a little bit more. We got a ton of questions here, so that's really great. Um, we're going to keep you you both busy here today. So um, let me start with one for for you, Dr. Jones. Uh, and that is, give us a little more detail if you're that person out there having headaches and you're wondering if you have migraines, how can you personally sort of have a, an idea of is this migraine or is this some other kind of headache and at what point should you seek therapy? Well, I think most people who are, going, who are coming to see me, they, the over-the-counter medicines are not working. Advil, Aleve, Tylenol, et cetera, they're, they're not very effective. Um, but I think if you have that slowly building throbbing pain, uh, you've got some degree of lights or noises that bother you or nausea. Those are all big features of migraines. I mean, tension-type headaches or dull, cap-like pressure. You don't hear severe. You don't have nausea. Cluster headaches, pretty rare. Those are the headaches that last 15 minutes to three hours, but they're horrible stabbing pain in and around the eye with tearing and redness. So migraines are pretty common. Like I said, about 18% of all women um, and usually start you know, in your teenage years. But, um, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, fair to say, if somebody's having some headaches, because we all, everybody has a headache at some point, and it goes away with some Tylenol or, or Aleve or Advil or something like that, generally don't need to necessarily seek care, or is there a trigger at that point? Is it just a frequency issue? I think if issue? you can get rid of your headaches with the, you know, routine meds over the counter, you mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think, you know, there are obviously ominous headaches with features that are concerning, like progressive headaches. Uh, if they have a neurologic deficit, numbness, tingling, persistent, um, you know, abnormal neurologic exam. We have some, some you know, features that would be concerning that's not a migraine. Um, and generally, you know, migraine patients don't need an MRI. Mm -hmm. We find abnormalities in less than 3%. Uh, but usually I buy an MRI if progressive severe headaches are taking a nosedive, they have an abnormal exam, or they had an unusual headache, like they're disoriented, they can't speak. Um, and so what, in those cases, what are you doing the MRI for? What would you Making sure about? there's no increased intracranial pressure, there's no tumor, there's no hydrocephalus. Uh, if someone has a whammo, thunderclap headache, well, you need to look for aneurysm. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone's best buddy just had a brain tumor, I'm probably going to get an MRI because they're going to worry if I don't. Right, right. Yeah. Good, good reason to do that. Okay, and, and, and a related question or a secondary question for that person was, tell us more about why the nausea? What is it with migraines that, that so you have this nausea? We know the CGRP, that calcinogen-related peptide, releases all these pain factors that, that give us our, our headache. Uh, but we also have other areas in the brain stem that get activated. The superior salivatory nucleus gets activated, which, guess what, causes nausea. So we have other centers in the brain that get activated that give us our symptoms. Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask you now back on back pain, a little bit related. So you talked about surgery as a last resort. Yeah. Okay. Walk people through. So how do you get there? What, when, mm -hmm. when do you have to do surgery? Are there times when 
you know, many, many times I know you're yeah. trying multiple modalities first and it's a last resort. When is it not a last resort or when does it happen quicker? Get, put a yeah. little finer point on all that. So, so basically, you know, the, the algorithm is, is pretty straightforward. The vast majority of patients who come in with back pain or leg pain uh, will go through, even if they have a mechan clear mechanical issue, will go through the steps of starting with medications and therapy because often those will work, um, even if they have a clear instability, they'll get better. Um, so we've done numerous studies looking at how pain correlates to imaging, and it doesn't correlate very well. Um, so just because the x-ray or the MRI shows all kinds of findings does not mean that a patient will ever need surgery. Now, there are times where we will uh, uh, go straight to surgery, and those are rare. But if a patient has uh, weakness or progressive weakness, um, they're having issues walking, uh, they're having issues with bowel or bladder control, then those can be urgent issues that need to be taken care of right away with surgery to decompress the nerves. Um, but again, those are rare instances. Now, for most patients who end up having surgery, which are very few percentage-wise, we go through all of the steps. And if we go through all of the steps and their pain is still severe, uh, and you know, typically at least a pain score of five, you know, six out of 10 or greater, uh, and we have some things that we use in our clinic, uh, which are instruments for surveys. One is called the back pain uh, ODI, which is a form they fill out. And if they score greater than 30 on that, they have more than six out of 10 pain. And they've tried everything. They have a clear mechanical issue. Uh, and I think once we get to that point, then we may talk about surgery and different options. And it, for every patient, it's a different discussion because it's a matter of risk versus benefits. And so if the patients are healthy, then it may make sense to have surgery. If the patient has a lot of medical issues, it may not make sense to have surgery. So you mentioned, uh, uh, I guess, um, clear mechanical issue. Um, lots of people have back pain. Yes. Lots. Um, how often is it a clear mechanical issue versus, you know, sort of yeah. nebulous musculoskeletal, but you can't quite pinpoint it, especially when you know that the imaging may not correlate with the symptoms. That seems like it makes your job pretty hard. Yes, so we often use a lot of different aspects to help that and to help determine the diagnosis outside of imaging. For instance, we have some excellent uh, injection specialists here, Dr. Sickler, for instance, who helps me greatly where I'll send the patient for different diagnostic injections to help determine where the pain is coming from. Um, and that can help in our diagnosis. But the vast majority of patients who get back pain, over 75% are nonspecific, as you mentioned. There is no clear mechanical issue, and so they are automatically not a surgical candidate. The issue is we don't know until we see them and do the workup and get the injections who, who really has the issues. Um, but I think that the, uh, uh, the injection specialists help us determine uh, who has an issue that we can help with. How often do you see people coming to you or mm. still having back pain who've maybe been operated on somewhere yet? Uh, Very common. It's been a little nonspecific. Do you see that sometimes? Yeah, so patients you said who have been operated? Yeah, like, yeah. like you'll see them, but somewhere else, yes, let's yes. say they've, they've had some nonspecific pain they've gotten operated on. Is that a common issue? Is that a common problem? Is that something people should be yes. alert to? So I guess, you know, the patients I see are a very select subset, but in my practice, I do see that often. And I think that, uh, you know, it depends on what the initial cause is. Now, spine surgery can help with mechanical issues that have failed non-operative treatment, but it only helps so much. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But generally, it can help, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent, but it won't cure all of a patient's pain. And so I think it's important for patients to understand that before surgery. Um, but if a patient's continuing to have back pain, there are some surgical reasons. If they had a fusion surgery but it didn't fuse, for instance, that's the most common reason where a patient can have continued back pain after surgery. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons where that could be the case. Okay, great. And last question before I switch back to Dr. Jones. Um, similar question I asked her, everybody gets some back pain. Um, when do you need to go seek care? What, yeah. what are those triggers for, hey, I better go in. This is more than, you know, I can just manage myself um, because there's certainly some that can just be managed, uh, you know, pretty simply. Absolutely. So back pain is ubiquitous. I mean, uh, when we look at studies, 80% of people will have back pain at some point in their life. Um, so I think that is, back pain is unfortunately a normal part of life. Um, and so, 
as you mentioned and Dr. Jones mentioned, you know, if you can treat it with some uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen or naproxen and it gets better, I think those patients are best served just doing that and moving on with their life. But w the time where you start considering seeing someone about it is if it becomes persistent or it doesn't respond to those medications over the counter. Then you want to th see uh, even just your primary care doctor or a specialist about uh, the pain, and it's really about how it impacts the patient's life. So uh, I have patients who are very active, and it prevents them from their job or their, you know, what their activities. And I think that's when you start uh, seeking care. Are there any kind of alarm systems, things that, if this is happening, period, you yes. got to come in, even if it hadn't been chronic, failing mm -hmm. therapy, etc. What would those be? I, absolutely. So the most. Uh, you know, significant finding is, and, and I see this once in a while, obviously, as a spine surgeon, is uh, something called cauda equina syndrome, where someone will have some, uh, they'll have numbness, shooting pain down one or both legs with weakness, and they may have bowel or bladder issues. Um, and so if this occurs, uh, someone needs to actually come to the emergency room uh, for that. It's frankly, or uh, fortunately rare, uh, but that's something that uh, is certainly an urgent issue. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, switching back to Dr. Jones, um, quite a few questions around triggers. Um, you know, uh, how do you pinpoint that? How do you sort of figure that out? What do you recommend to your patients as they're sorting that out? Because clearly, if they know triggers, you can right you can there. Avoid that's, them. Uh, you right. can avoid them, and that's a, that's a big issue. And I guess I'll ask a related question. Sometimes the triggers are something people really, really like a lot. Like yes. Red, red wine, wine <laughs> or chocolate, you right? know, and so what do you tell people around those areas? So. I, I tell every patient, I give them some information, I call it my migraine FYI, and it's got a blurb on the medicines, but you know, we keep a, a headache diary. So there's a couple of apps, uh, Migraine Buddy, I Headache, uh, you can track your headaches because actually that headache could be cooking for three days before you get the pain. So I tell folks, your Friday night glass of froge can give you your Monday headache. Uh, that's kind of a long time to look back, but I mentioned only 26% have food triggers. Um, but yeah, aged cheeses, smoked meats, nuts. Uh, I had a lady who said, I went to the Astros game, I, I eat peanuts, I get a headache. Then she went to a fish fry, peanut oil, all right. Yeah. But then, you yeah. know, maybe she doesn't get a headache every time. But keeping that headache there can be very helpful. And then like you on the on the weekend, is that stress let down? Yay, I'm not at work. Right. Or I'm sleeping in. Or I slept, you know, try and be on even keel. Uh, and that helps, but stress is a number one trigger uh, and or stress letdown. Yay, finals are over, mm -hmm. <sighs> boom, there's a headache. Yeah. Hormonal for women, ovulation, menses, uh, we'll see it uh, less with pregnancy, usually estrogen being very high. Uh, most women they're in their second, third trimester, no, no migraines. Uh, we'll see it with weather change, and most of my patients are happy now, no weather change. Uh, strong odors uh, can be a trigger, you know, incense, smoke, uh, perfumes. Uh, and then we'll see it, I mentioned with the food triggers, sometimes bright lights, uh, loud noises like a shotgun blast. So, uh, you know, everyone's sort of different, but yeah, if you can you avoid your triggers, that. uh, that's great, you know. What about, what about menopause? What's the relationship of menopause and migraine? So a question about that, that withdrawal of estrogen once a month when you have your, your, your period uh, is usually a big trigger for migraine patients. So usually day three, two or three of menses. Um, and so that's why we see more headaches in women probably after you, your teenage years when you start puberty. Uh, now in menopause, average age 51, about 60% of women get rid of their headaches to get a lot better. Uh, there's no estrogen. Um, so that, that does seem to be playing a role. Um, now paradoxically, you'll give some women estrogen, birth control, hormone replacement, and they can get more headaches. So we, we can see that too. So. so the most common thing you're seeing is with menopause, it actually tends 60 to 60% can get down. better. Right. The question here was actually, somebody who felt like it got more frequent after menopause. Do you see yeah. that sometimes, or is that just more presentation of when it happened? Or? I think that might be a red flag. If someone's having a new onset migraine or worsening of headaches after 55, I mean, less than 5% will have a, a new onset migraine after 55, unless they've had a good history. Um, but that might be someone having more headaches, yeah, to, to investigate it further. Okay, great, well, thank you. A couple of questions that came in while we were here. Um, massage, massage or massage therapy, does that help back pain? So there is some evidence looking at massage therapy. Uh, it tends to be short-lived, but it can be helpful. I think for nonspecific back pain or for lumbar strain, for instance, I think it's a good option. And they specifically ask, does it rebound or does it get worse after? Like it feels good then, but maybe it's worse after? Or, do you, or, or does the data support that mm -hmm. while it wears off, it, it, it can help over time? 
Uh, I have not seen it get worse afterwards. Okay. So I think you can get some improvement. It may be short-lived, um, but I think for the patients who have a strain, they're usually self-contained in terms of the natural history, meaning that it'll get better over time. So really for those patients, what we aim to do is to make them comfortable until their body heals itself. And I think massage therapy is probably one of the things that you can do during that time. And the other question, I know this will be a loaded one for you a little bit, what about chiropractic? Um, so, how, do, how does chiropractic care fit into the equation for somebody with So that? there is actually a few studies looking at chiropractic care, um, and they do show improvement uh, in some ways similar to massage therapy, that uh, there is short-term improvement afterwards. And I think a lot of the issue with some of the literature is that the, the patients who are there treating are heterogeneous in terms of their diagnoses. But I think for patients with kind of nonspecific lumbar strain, it can be helpful, particularly for short-term uh, short exacerbations. Okay, very good. Uh, and uh, one, one last question that came in is um, injections. Yes. Uh, can that go on indefinitely? You get a few months of relief, you get another one, you get another few months of relief. Is there a limit to how long someone can do that? So that's a great question, and it depends on the patient specifically. The biggest issue with injections and the frequency depends on patients who are diabetic. Um, so patients who are diabetic and how much, uh, you know, if they're insulin diabetic patients, we tend to limit injections more uh, than patients who are not. Um, it also depends on the patient's medical condition. So uh, patients who have had, say, you know, transplants or not surgical candidates, uh, you know, will tend to do more injections to avoid surgery. Um, so I think it just depends on the specific patient. But there are some really incredible injection options and ablation options that have come available in the last decade. Okay, good. Well, thank you both. Well, fascinating, fascinating discussion. I hope this was useful for everybody. We've tried to get to most of the questions you brought in or at least get to a grouping of them. Uh, if you have other questions, I hope you've been getting them, them answered. I want to thank Dr. Safey very much for being here, Dr. Jones for being here. I want to thank Dr. Saleme in the background and Dr. Green in the background as well. I know you've probably been typing furiously there, helping people uh, with their questions. And of course, um, we're always happy to see you in if need be as a patient. I'm gonna do a very quick update, if I may grab a clicker there from you, Dr. Safey, thank you. I'm gonna do a very quick update here now. On, I, I like to avoid COVID. Of course, these, uh, these uh, uh, sessions here, these town halls started because of COVID, but unfortunately I gotta talk a little bit more about it today that I've been talking about lately because we are seeing all the signs of a little bit of a surge. Now, this is not a cause for dramatic alarm or anything, but I did wanna review that with you and talk a little bit about it. This is actually uh, July, it's how much COVID is in a state in July versus how much COVID is in a state uh, in June. And the darker colors are bad. So you can see uh, Texas is leading the way in this case. Um, and I can tell you up significantly in the month of August now. Now, I want to put this in perspective and we'll show that with some of the slides. This is nothing like what we're talking about a couple of years ago, but we are in the midst of somewhat of a surge. It's interesting and I'll talk about that, but there's clearly some seasonality and some pattern that we're, we're learning about this virus that, that varies across the country uh, as you look at this put it in a little bit of perspective, this is the whole pandemic here and you know how many infections per day there were. You can see at one point it goes off the chart just to see it. So you can see all the way on the right here, while this is a significant number of infections in the US, it's nothing compared to what we've seen. And even as we saw higher ones in the more recent surges, those did not result in quite the severity nor the hospitalization, thanks to the fact, frankly, that everybody's got some level of immunity. You find a, a rare exception to that, but uh, you know, most people have been vaccinated multiple times. And if you haven't been vaccinated, very few people haven't had infection. And even if you have been vaccinated, as you know, um, people have had infections. And I'll talk about some of that pattern in a bit. This is city of Houston. Um, wastewater monitoring, I'll, I'll call your attention mainly to the bottom there. Um, if you remember, they pinned things to uh, July 6th of 2020, our first big surge, right at the peak of that first big surge we had with the small surge uh, in April, May. Uh, and then they do viral load in the wastewater. So we're actually at 239% of that. Um, so we have a lot more people infected than we did at that terrible time. But of course now, We've all got lots of immunity flowing around. Maybe the virus is, is a little milder as well, probably is. Uh, and so we don't see quite the hospitalization, but the city of Houston now is running 20% of people, 21% of people being tested 
are positive. And I can tell you last week, 239 was something like 179 or something like that. It's been going up pretty substantially. It had gotten down into the kind of 50-ish percent range, something like that, uh, maybe even a little bit lower than that. And this is what we're seeing at Houston Methodist. This is the whole deal. This is the whole pandemic. So you can see over to the right, it's nothing like what we experienced in the worst times. It's still not what we've experienced the last couple where those, I, I would call, manageable surges where we had a large number of patients went up fairly quickly, uh, but we did not have extreme numbers of patients like before, but we are watching a, a surge happen here. So what does this mean for you, right? If you are relatively young and healthy, if you've had COVID, if you've been vaccinated, you know, now's a higher risk time to get COVID, but COVID's probably mild in most people like that. So you need to look at your own personal situation. Um, if you are older, if you are immunocompromised, if you have reasons to be at higher risk, now is entering a pretty high risk time for you. There's no question. Um, and so you really need to look at what your vaccination status is right now if you're in that situation, if you're anybody, but particularly if you're in that situation. For many, 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 many people, the last time they were vaccinated was either last fall or even before that. Um, last fall was the, the bivalent booster that we got at that point in time. We had okay uptake nationally, but not great uptake at that point in time. And then in the spring, the recommendation, that's what you see here, was that we would vaccinate people at higher risk with another booster. That is the vaccine we're still using right now. So I'll come back to that in a second. This October, we expect a new vaccine based on kind of a variant that was circulating a few months ago. The one that's really coming up right now and probably to some extent causing this surge is kind of a, a, a lineage variant of that. And so we, we have every reason to believe this vaccine will cover it. So in October or so, you're going to be eligible for the next booster. We're gonna highly encourage everybody to get that. I know I will get that. Um, but this is where you need to do a little bit of sort of personal evaluation. If you are elderly, if you are immunocompromised, and it's been more than a few months since your last vaccine or more than a few months since your last infection, let's say your last was in last fall, I'd go ahead and get this now and then wait a few months and get the new booster at that point in time because you are going to be entering a period where it is a little bit higher risk for you. So that would be the advice of our scientific committee here as well, uh, that uh, uh, essentially we seem to be migrating towards a probably an annual booster that gets updated. And if you're in a higher risk group, probably a twice a year. It does look like what essentially happens is whether it's infection or whether it's vaccination, you get a few months of really good coverage from actually getting infected. That probably has to do with circulating antibody levels and, and uh, mucose membrane uh, antibodies and other things like that. And then that tends to wane. You're well protected against severe illness and worse. Um, but uh, from an infection standpoint, you really wane some, some uh, immunity at that point. So if you're really high risk, you're probably looking at about an every six month cadence we expect right now. And you just saw that slide at the beginning. I really do think we are seeing a, a seasonal pattern depending on where you live. Now, some of this may be timing of when those waves have happened, and some of this is probably seasonal pattern. I think what happens in the south and the southeast is we are all way more indoors. It's actually kind of cold indoors. The air gets dried out when we know our mucous membranes are more susceptible and we get infections and surges because this is now the fourth summer in a row, slightly different timing, but the fourth in a row that we're seeing some sort of surge. And then sort of six months later, when all the immunity is waning from that, you end up seeing the next surge. So I would suggest uh, personalize, think about it, but uh, be thinking about that uh, cadence for your next vaccine. Shifting to a little happier and more fun topic, uh, we were very excited uh, to see that yet again, Houston Methodist uh, did really, really well uh, in uh, U.S. News and World Report. Actually, uh, it's interesting, U.S. News changed their methodology this year to where two things they did. One is if you make the honor roll, they no longer rank you. Um, so uh, uh, they now say, hey, you're in that honor roll group. It's, it's the top 20 hospitals. This year there was a three-way tie for 20, so there's 22 of us in there. Uh, 
it's funny because they tell us where we are underneath that, but we're not allowed to publicize that. I can tell you, we moved up. We actually are doing really, really well. We actually had two of our highest specialties ever. We had uh, uh, one specialty in diabetes, number four, and GI, which is our Underwood Center, uh, was number five in the country. So we're very proud of that and very excited about that. Kudos to the team. You know, we talk about focusing on the fundamentals. The awards will follow. And that's one of the things that happened here. The other thing they did, interestingly, is they said, okay, so uh, for making state status, they used to have two different methodologies. It was kind of weird. Now they've said, look, if you make the honor roll, you're number one in the state. Well, in California, there's five hospitals in the top 22 this year. So there's five number ones in California. I think there's four in New York couple in Massachusetts, and we now have company, because um, congratulations to UT Southwestern. They, they, they got on the, uh, the honor roll for their first, very first time in history. So we're sharing number one in Texas, and likely will do so for quite a while, unless they change that methodology or one or the other of us drop back off. But it's, it's great to see that. I think competition always drives performance. You know, I always talk about uh, when hospital systems and academic medical centers compete on safety, quality, service, and innovation, patients win. And so we think Think that's uh, really a great thing. Here's the best hospitals honor roll. So you can see last year numbers. <laughs> and on the right, you can now see this year alphabetical because there are the institutions that are there uh, on the list. And we're very proud of what the team accomplished. So kudos to everybody uh, across the institution. We are ranked in 10 specialties, as I mentioned. You can see there almost all of them uh, top 20. Actually, uh, uh, one of them is 25. That's the lowest we are ranked. You can see a number four, number five, and then uh, many in the teens. And so uh, again, uh, great performance, great consistency, a place you know you can come to with confidence and have really care across the spectrum. We saw two large areas of that here today. So with that, thank you all very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our very next event.